Welcome one and all to the Ferret and Raccoon podcast episode 225. I am your one and only host for this podcast, The Angry Raccoon, bringing you the first podcast of September 2023. And we're going to be doing things slightly differently on this episode. I'm kind of going to be varying things up in terms of the things I'm going to be discussing, mainly because we had Gamescom happen over the last few days slash week. And I've kind of been trying to keep up with that for the most part. But before we get into Gamescom and all the trailers and some of the news we have to talk about, I'm going to discuss some of the things I did over the last two weeks since the previous podcast. The first thing being that I was still and are still playing uh, Crash Team Rumble. They did release the new playable character being Engine, and that was a whole interesting experience for the most part. He plays okay. His moves and abilities kind of seem to get eaten by the geometry of the game. So for example, he has a move where he can throw down a boombox, which kind of has an AOE effect. If you are to place said boombox down while there's already a place item there, just nothing happens. It's very frustrating, especially if you try to do his sort of like jetpack boost jump move, which kind of blasts people away. Um, If someone hits you after you press the input of that, it just doesn't happen. And yeah, he's just an okay character. He's too slow. He's nowhere near what I think a booster character, which the people who can do certain things a lot faster should be. I mean, it's all about speed, yet you have a very slow character. It's it's very odd. Also, I experienced a lot of uh, connection issues with this game. It kept disconnecting and saying that I lost connection for the most part, which it wasn't on my end, simply put, because I was able to do things and people in the house were able to do things with the internet despite that. So I don't know what's going on, but yeah. The other game I've been playing, gaming-centric podcast, in case you haven't really figured it out, I was playing the DLC for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, Shredder's Revenge, uh, Dimension Shellshock. I've been playing that a couple of times. It's really fun. I really enjoy it. I've mainly been playing as the newer characters being Yusaki and Karai. They're a lot of fun. I kind of prefer Karai over Yusaki, but I like him equally as much. It's a lot of fun. I really like what they've done and the whole survival mode and the whole incentive to keep playing the survival mode to unlock different perks to make survival mode easier and the rewards of having very specific and interesting color palettes. So, for example, unlocking the black and white color palette, which is in reference to the original comics that the that spawned the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series, which was originally a joke. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. The other game I've also been playing, not too far into, is Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, which is uh, kind of dubbed as the spiritual sequel to the Jet Set Radio franchise, which was originally made by Sega um, on the Dreamcast, and later the Jet Set Radio future sequel being on, I believe, Xbox and PS2. Um, I say spiritual sequel because Sega pretty much just refuses to remake or do anything with this franchise despite there being a clear interest from yeah granted a niche but a very vocal audience who are like hey can you do something with this franchise to which Sega has kind of just um ignored the audience which I get it but at the same time and, and there was also the, like, a whole rumor about like this fake animation is meant to be like a reboot or remake so a small independent studio has took it upon themselves to essentially make a, another Jet Set Radio game, and I can happily report it's really good. It is in the flavor or the vibe of the Jet Set Radio franchise, but it also kind of evolves and kind of does its own things in some very interesting ways, more in a narrative and aesthetical way. It does look like a high-end, let's say, a 4K, 60 frames per second running PS2 game. It is very reminiscent of the Y2K kind of aesthetic and style that has kind of made a bit of a comeback over the last couple years, but it's very prevalent here. Like the sky is never just one color. It's always like a hue of one of these more particular colors that we most fondly think about when we talk about or regard the 2000s era. It's a lot of fun. My only criticism against this game so far, and I'm kind of going to give them a little bit of a pass because it is an independent developer. I believe it's their first or one of their first games. So I wasn't, I'm not expecting a perfect game from someone who's, you know, trying to do something that isn't commonly done, being essentially a freestyle, free roaming, uh, you know, combo Tony Hawk's-esque sports game, you know, if you were to really break it down to its simplest form. Um, I feel like the game could have been a little bit clearer in terms of explaining certain things. 
Um, I don't really know what you're supposed to do when it comes to the boss battles. It's I, I'm all for like a game not telling you what to do and you figuring it out, but the game literally doesn't tell you anything when it comes to these bosses. You, I don't know if it's like oh you, it's obvious or you're just supposed to figure it out. I don't know. As well, there is a, a mechanic in the game where when you rail grind on you know rails, you can if you turn or, or lean as they put it in a direction you kind of get a boost a speed boost which adds to your combo this is very important for the basis of the game itself but when the game tells you how to do this it you know visually shows you that which is great but it doesn't tell you when exactly you should lean it doesn't say you should lean before you make that turn or on the turn or after the turn or if you you know if you're turning left do you turn left or lean left in that direction it's not very specific and it took me a while to figure out that you have to preemptively do it before you make that turn and then make that switch for the next turn. I feel like just them saying that or visually communicating that or even just having in the pause menu a way for you to go back and look at tutorials I think would have helped the game massively but I'm really enjoying it, I'm really invested in it, I just want to play more of it and uh, I think you should really support this game if you want to play something that's a little bit more interesting and a little bit more in favor of you know just a fun video game which is something video games don't well don't and aren't often nowadays they're too busy trying to nickel and dime you which is a massive shame, unfortunately. But let's get into some news stories. And we've got two regarding uh, gaming before we actually get into the trailers. And the first is the fact that uh, Volition Studios has uh, unsurprisingly and shadedly been closed by the Embracer uh, company. So first off, this is incredibly sad. A lot of people could and have lost their jobs. My sympathy goes to all the people who were simply doing their job making games for Volition or for the um, Embracer group. For the most part, for those of you who don't know, Volition are best known for making the Saints Row franchise, which is going to be more um, relevant as I talk about this. Um, I have no, I have zero sympathy for anyone at Volition who was in charge of the direction, marketing, or made any other high up decision at Volition, um, simply because this is partly their fault why Volition has closed. I say partly because. Volition does not own the rights to the Saints Row, and I'm referring to the mess that was the Saints Row reboot that came out last year. Um, Deep Silver owns the rights to um, Saints Row, and I would imagine, and doing more research, it is apparent that Deep Silver were the ones who decided to go in said direction with this Saints Row franchise, but at the same time, Volition were the ones who, you know, basically sealed their fate permanently i think you know deep silver made the coffin volitions marketing and advertising or whatever you want to call it higher ups or you know anyone in that position were the ones who nailed the coffin in for the most part um that game was a poor excuse for a reboot and a game and i'm not even going to go into everything that made that game bad because there are plenty of videos on youtube that have already explained why the game is trash but it being a bad game was one of the main reasons why Embracer has closed the developer. It, the game sold poorly, it had a very poor reception. And one of the main factors, which I think a lot of people are citing as the reason why the studio is closing, is because, you know, it, it wasn't a Saints Row game. If we're just going to look at this game as being the reason why, which I think it is. Um, yeah, it was an inoffensive game made to appeal to everyone, or mainly the Twitter audience they deep silver themselves have kind of said not directly have kind of implied that based on how the original saints row games were you know like gang warfare gta-esque that people aren't interested in that kind of game and that it isn't a consumer friendly thing to make which obviously plenty of people mainly saints row fans would argue against so this is, was a whole situation which I talked about on the podcast last year and all that, where when fans saw this Saints Row reboot, they were confused and they felt betrayed because also apparently Deep Silver and Volition had said they were going back to their roots, a, they, referring to this game, which obviously became the reboot as a Saints Row 2.5. To hear that and then see this, what a lot of people would like to call this woke take on the Saints Row franchise was obviously very disheartening for a lot of people. So a lot of fans rightfully criticize the game. They are in their right and their opinion to say they don't like this. 
You know, they were expecting one thing and they are not getting that. To which Volition, mainly the marketing, mainly the Twitter and some of the higher ups, the producers and in interviews, decided to clap back at the haters with very condescending comments and replies like haters gonna hate and you don't know what you want and in some examples referring to fans or older fans as terrorists for liking what the original games were. There is nothing wrong with liking the past especially if said product is something that you necessarily don't want to make anymore. We're seeing a lot of people nowadays kind of disowning their past and their history which not unless you were blatantly like racist or homophobic, you shouldn't really be doing, you should be, you know, respecting it to some extent, it was a different time, and, you know, like-minded, intelligent people will understand it was a different time, you don't have to just try and scrub the history like Disney tries to do, so you have that whole situation of them just kind of going on this massive tangent and all these other questionable things, which I think are incredibly unfortunate for the most part, to essentially say that audiences don't know what they want and then release a game that barely even works with a broken combat system, unlikable characters and a non-existent story is just baffling at the end of the day. So it's a wonder why no one bought the game. Well, not really, because the one thing Volition and so many studios nowadays and developers and publishers don't seem to realise is you don't bite the hand that feeds you at the end of the day. Yeah, sure, they're the ones making the games, and they're the ones giving us the games, but we can just not buy your game. And clearly lots of people didn't buy your game, because you're now shut down. Because now Embrace is having a panic attack, because they've lost assets, and they wanted this to be a big franchise. So yeah, lesson learnt, maybe. We'll see. But, you know, things get really re- weird regarding this information, uh, especially when it, um, it was found out, or you know, kind of discovered more accurately um, via a post on the website LinkedIn. Yeah, not Twitter, not their official website, LinkedIn of all places. Yeah, the text itself reads like a corporate statement by Embracer pretending to be volition. And I'll read it just so you guys can have that context if you don't want to, you know, read it yourself or check the description and download link as essentially the very blank and the very common, you know, statement that we've seen a lot of a lot of times posted when a game messes up or that where it's just the blank background and text pretending like they're sorry. So the, I guess, confirmation reads by saying, the Volition team has proudly created world-class entertainment for fans around the globe for 30 years. We've been driven by a passion for our community and always work to deliver joy, surprise and delight. The past June, Embracer Group announced that announced a restriction a restriction pro- restructuring excuse me restructuring program to strengthen embracer and maintain its position as a leader in the video game industry as part of the program that equated that I'm get I'm looking at a screen I'm not actually reading it so it's kind of tricky to see with the um glare um strategies and operational goals and made the difficult decision to close volition effective immediately to help our team we are working to provide job job assistance and help smooth transitions for our volition family members we thank our customers and our fans around the world for all the love and support over the years you will always be in our hearts volition games now knowing how volition games has become and how they talk to their audience they would never post something like that simply put the people who work at Volition have made it very apparent that they have a great animosity to people who don't like the new game or people who want the old franchise. Embracer most likely wrote this post, posted it on LinkedIn, where, you know, obviously no one's looking at information regarding, you know, business and companies. And I think they're just kind of trying to sweep this under the rug and like quietly liquefy the Volition name which is very, very shady, especially when you look at the Embracer group and how they lost a deal with the Saudi Arabian government and all that kind of stuff. It's strange. Even stranger still is the fact that the Saints Row reboot that came out last year is one of the free games on offer for PlayStation Plus members this September. Yeah, there's something really funny going on, and that doesn't stop just there, because we're going to stay with Sony for the next story, as... um. Yeah, linking back to this, Sony is to raise the prices of PlayStation Plus subscriptions for those of 
for those people who specifically buy the yearly um, the yearly plan. So not necessarily the you want one month subscription, three month subscription, five month subscription, six months, etc., etc. Specifically the yearly subscription, which is a standard. Most people get a yearly subscription for the most part. So simply put, what is going on is they are raising the prices and they very sneakily did this during their latest blog post where they were talking about the new games which you can get via um, PlayStation Plus, one of them being the Saints Row Reboot, the game that nobody liked. Um, simply put, this is greed at its finest. They are raising the prices and offering nothing because of it. Because yes, the prices are going up and they are not giving you anything else. Like, it's, they're not giving you an extra free game, they're not improving the service, they're not, there's no kind of, like, apology for this. So, the prices themselves, because Sony, on this blog post, do not tell people what the original prices were. And I think, once again, much like with Embracer and Volition, they are trying, trying to sweep this under the rug, they're trying to not have this become, you know, public knowledge, which it unfortunately has because of how shady they've done this. Um, and they're kind of hoping that, you know, no one will notice and no one will complain unfortunately for them. So there's three main services under PlayStation Plus, for those of you who don't know, or if you're more of a Xbox Nintendo person. There are three plans. The first plan is essential is the essential plan, which was originally, and this is in dollars, so you can do the working out in pounds over here, but I'm going to use dollars for now. It will go from $60 to $80. The extra plan, which was originally $100, is now going up to $135, and the premium plan, which was $120, is going up to $160. That is an increase of 35%. Ridiculous. And it's even more egregious when you consider the fact that, yes, Microsoft did put up the price of its you know, subscription-based service, but they put it up by 13%. Obviously, people are also going to say, well, lots of subscription services are putting their prices up because of how tough it is to live. It's even more egregious, once again, when you consider the fact that people like Netflix and um, who's, and Disney Plus have only really increased it by 10%. Granted, no one should be doing this because these companies can afford to not increase these prices. But I digress. That's still a big hike. Now, are you, are you trying to tell me that Sony is struggling financially? No. That's like Apple asking for a handout at the end of the day. Sony is wealthy enough to keep the prices as they are, or even lower them in order to combat their competitors. No one would complain if PlayStation Plus went down in price and they bragged about it going, yeah, it's cheaper than Xbox. That would be a great thing. Business and competition is always good at the end of the day. Um, you know, this is BS at the end of the day. Like, what, you didn't make money selling the rights for a Last of Us TV show? What, the God of War Ragnarok flopped? No. This is greed at its simplest. They're only doing this because everyone else is doing it. They, they're they treating this like it's a new standard and that it can't be helped. Like, oh, we, we have to raise the prices because everyone else is doing it. Like, no, you don't. You are taking, and they are taking advantage of their audience... Because they, because they know that no one else is buying this subscription, presumably, and they are punishing people that play for it because other people don't. It's egregious at the end of the day. They are taking advantage of brand and loyal fan bases. They have specifically not made this a public thing because they knew people would be upset, and they are hoping that they can recoup the losses of people cancelling subscriptions after the price rise, by hoping that these people that don't know or have expendable cash or unaware will just recoup the losses, like I said. It is disgusting at the end of the day. They better bring the price down or expect a bigger loss than they already are considering. Because I know some people went back and referred to the fact that Sony is no longer going to be sharing, sorry, regarding its um, shareholders and stuff like that, where they, they don't want to let the shareholders know how poorly it's doing. So they're kind of trying to raise the prices in order to show their shareholders, oh, look, it's doing better than it was before, despite they're just, you know, like I said, just it's, it's greed at the end of the day. And it's just disgusting. And I hate it when studios and people just try and take advantage of gamers and all that kind of stuff. Like, the only reason I continued my subscription for PlayStation Plus was because it automatically renewed, and it was be and I did it before this news that on September 12th, 
the price was going up. So that's the only reason why I still have it, and I've cancelled it since then, because I'm not doing it. So in terms of me playing Crash Team Rumble, that's probably not going to happen unless they bring the prices back down, which knowing Sony and their infinite wisdom, they're probably not going to. But you know what? Fuck them at the end of the day. Um, now let's talk about games, because games come happen, and I'm going to talk about a select few of games. Not everything, especially since that at the time of this recording, Gamescom is still actually happening. There are still dropping trailers. People are still releasing stuff and all that and information. So if I do get anything wrong or I question something because I don't understand it and that information is out there, yeah, I just didn't know because I'm not going to watch every single video on it because, yeah, I have a life. So this first trailer we have is going to be for the announcement trailer for Call of the Lamb Cross uh, Don't Starve Together. Um, these games are the games that keep on giving. I know that there is a ton of content regarding the Don't Starve game. You know, just more characters, more expansion packs, more DLC. Even Call of the Lamb has done a couple of things with free updates and stuff like that. And little events where you can get little additional aesthetical things, which is pretty co good. Um, this was a surprising collaboration, but it makes sense given the similar themes and gameplay styles of both these games. They're both kind of sims. They're both like... Um, rogue-like you know open world games and all that kind of stuff and the animated trailer itself is simple but cute like the main characters see the other within the context of their own worlds so for example wilson considered one of the main characters of don't starve he he sees the lamb dressed up as just a lamb in a cloak you know with a hat you know because yeah in the context of his world it's just a sheep Whereas the lamb sees Winston as a monster or a follower or like a spider to some extent. I mean, this game once again just reminds me that I still need to play Don't Starve Together. It seems like a fun game and I love its Tim Burton-esque aesthetic. So yeah, wanted to mention that in case I'm, I'm sure they're both fans of both these franchises are going to eat this up, which is great for the most part. Uh, next trailer we have to talk about is going to be for Dead by Daylight, which is going to be the alien as in 19... 1979's Aliens launch trailer, um, which is pretty interesting. Never, honestly think I've never actually talked about Dead by Daylight on the podcast, not even when it was announced, I don't think. But um, yeah, the uh, Xenomorph Queen is in this game now, as well as um, Ripley A, but we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, the model looks great with the Alien uh, Queen, although I can tell they've taken some creative liberties with her design. Her mouth doesn't look like that in the films like she doesn't have teeth like that why they've changed that i do not know that detail doesn't affect how she would play in a game like this unlike her movement speed or her attack so i don't know maybe it's a rights thing or a copyright thing i don't know um i've seen the queen in action and i love her like sort of like unique select screen animation where she kind of creeps in and creeps into place um, but I hate the fact that her tail is always present as like the main source of attacking people. I think that's kind of stupid in a lot of regards. I mean, when most people think of the Xenomorph, the last thing they think about in terms of how they kill or attack people is the tail. Yes, Xenomorphs have killed people with their incredibly sharp tail, but it's not their main form of attacking people. They usually jump on people or use their second mouth to punch someone's skull. So I don't know what that's about. They should have just had her creepy hands on screen. That would have been really cool. Um, yeah, Ripley 8 is the character you're playing as, which is interesting. Um, from the film that no one likes, huh? Yeah. I wonder if this is because they couldn't get the rights to Ripley or, um, Sigourney Weaver's likeness from Alien and Aliens, because I know Sigourney Weaver's pretty much done with the Alien franchise, understandably. And, yeah, Ripley 8. Okay, whatever. I guess it explains why, to some extent, it looks nothing like Sigourney Weaver, but okay. Um, Dead by Daylight continues to be a powerhouse when it comes to acquiring the rights to horror franchises, which I'm sure a lot of people have noticed. Horror franchises are just very prevalent in the video game industry right now, and it's a very one-sided situation right now, where these franchises, franchises are either in Dead by Daylight, or they're getting their own game similar to Dead by Daylight. Obviously, we just got the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game that just came out. We had the um, Ash vs. Evil Dead game. We have Killer Clowns from Outer Space, which that, that game's coming out. And we obviously had like the Friday the 13th game, which was kind of like the original rivalry that started it all off where Dead by Daylight was going up against that game. And I guess Dead by Daylight has proven to be the one that stood the test of time. I mean, at the end of the day, I guess if you can't beat them, join them is, I guess, what 
is being said or addressed here for the most part. Uh, next trailer we have is going to be for Alien Hominoid, uh, the HD re-release trailer. Yes, this game has been released and re-released several times. And um, yeah, this is a great game. Um, it's good to see it's slightly remastered yet again, but with new features this time, because I originally played it on the Xbox 360, which in of itself was the HD version of it, because it is an older game based on a Flash Newgrounds game, which is pretty cool. Um, the main reason why I'm talking about this game, other than the fact that you should go play and support it if you don't already have it, I doubt it's going to be a very expensive game, unlike um, Rockstar, the people who made this game aren't going to charge you $60 for it. Um, it's a very significant game. It is a very interesting part of gaming history. And it's also because I bought this game on PS2 literally like a couple of days ago. So now I own two copies of this game and probably will own a third. Um, next trailer we have another really, really interesting one. And that is going to be Rugrats Adventures in Gameland. Now this is an original Rugrats game inspired by NES games. But it gets a little bit more interesting than that. The game itself looks awesome, like it's aesthetically faithful to the 8-bit era, you know, down to the limited colours the NES could create or produce, and the character sprites look pretty much on Polo with a slight kind of like Japanese um, theming to it, like so for example when the characters win a stage they kind of do like the peace sign, that's not something you typically would see in western themed or western made NES games back then, It was that was typically more of a well, yeah, an Asian Japanese thing that would usually happen. So I kind of like that attention to detail for the most part, especially since they want to be as authentic as possible, which they're doing a pretty good job at doing for the most part. And also, I have never seen a game be played in 8-bit and a HD mode. Yeah, you can just change into a more HD reminiscent of the cartoon style mode. Like, that is super impressive and really catering that they've made essentially two ways to play the game and two whole visual aesthetics. That is wild at the end of the day. That is really crazy. Um, yeah, it's, it's super awesome. And I mean, Nickelodeon are becoming the masters of funding projects in effective nostalgia ways that reference the, you know, the past. It feels genuine and it still works today as a niche because obviously not every game looks like this. I mean, Nickelodeon, I mean, all the games they have coming out, like, obviously, I've talked about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, they have the Nickelodeon All-Stars Brawl, they have the kart racing game, like, god damn, you guys just keep it up at the end of the day, man, like, you know, keep telling these studios like THQ Nordic and all that to, you know, keep making these games, I want to see more of your franchise get, get games as good as this for the most part, um, last two trailers we have to talk about is going to be for, let me check right here, oh yeah, Mullet Math Jack. Now, this is an interesting one that caught my eye. It is going for that retro vibe, which, to be honest, I am kind of getting a bit bored of for the most part. Every game is doing that kind of throwback, but I think this one's doing it well and in an interesting way, as it does have these sort of garish colours that you see with games of that era. Like, it, it aesthetically looks ugly to some extent, and it has really over the top character designs, you know, obviously cybernetic. This game is basically what cyberpunk should have been to some extent um it reminds me a lot of the original shadow warrior with how over the top it is and how just stupid and just bizarre it is with its very simple combat you know gunplay you know melee play and all that kind of stuff like the cutscene animations are really cool they have like a very stilted of the time movement fluidity for the most part and i do kind of love the marriage of western action feels particularly from the 80s mainly our main character who's very much the action hero of said film with, you know, anime, Western, sorry, not Western, um, Asian theming for the most part. You don't really see that. So many people kind of go for that 80s retro aesthetic, but they never kind of, you know, put together the fact that a lot of what people consider retro in 80s, especially when replicating the aesthetic, does also come from Japan and anime for the most part, because they arguably did it the best and they are still some of the best at doing it for the most part. And the last trailer we have to talk about is going to be for Little Nightmares 3. Very surprised and very happy that they are continuing the franchise. I have not played the second one, unfortunately, so please, no spoilers. <laughs> um, I don't think this game, or, well, more likely this trailer is spoiling anything, but I'm loving the look of this. Um, what's interesting about it as well is the fact that Tharsha, Tharsha Studios, who made the first two games, aren't making this one. 
rather it's supermassive games who are the studio that made Until Dawn, the Dark Pictures Anthology, uh, The Quarry. I do wonder why they're the ones now in charge of this. I know that they um, primarily work with uh, Namco Bandai, but I do wonder what's up with the direction and if they're going to continue the direction of the previous games or take it in a new direction. They are a good studio to do that. They are very cinematic. They do make, you know, primarily um, cinematic games that kind of try to be movies. This game doesn't look like a movie. It's still trying to be a game, but I can see them doing some wonderful things with the cinematography and the scale perspective and all that kind of stuff. And we do see that in the trailer where you've got our tiny little characters and they're running through a city and there's some giant monster baby trying to grab them. That's epic as hell. That puts God of War to shame in a lot of regards because that game had no idea how to handle perspective and scale. Um, but yeah, it, it looks really cool. Ironically, it looks massive in scale once again like the world looks big it looks like more of an open world game despite the fact i know it's going to be more linear because that is kind of the point of the franchise for the most part and it does have a slightly more brighter um color palette not to say there's anything wrong with the darker drearier bluish black and white aesthetic that the previous two had nothing wrong with that because the main character you played as in the first game being six she wore a yellow raincoat these characters stand out because granted there's two of them which is obviously a very odd sight to see in a somewhat side-scrolling you know platformer game but they wear masks you know they look weird you know it's great the key aesthetics that have made this franchise so great are still there so i you know i i, I do trust super massive games with this franchise i'm just very interested to see what they're going to do with it because this trailer wasn't overtly scary or creepy it was more epic which is fine. They're obviously trying to impress people. I get that. It's a trailer. I just hope that nothing is lost with this game. But yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to it. I really, really, really need to play the second game. I've heard good things about it, and I'm wondering what exactly happened in that game for us now to be following these two characters, whoever the hell they are. But yeah, no, really happy that this series has continued on and that Namco has clearly understood that this game has a future. Um, that's pretty much going to be the podcast. If there is anything uh, surprising that comes out of Gamescom, I'll talk about it in the next podcast. But yeah, we're pretty much done for the most part. Um, I wanted to focus more on smaller things and things that are interesting and things that have slipped the crack and kind of were relevant to a lot of people. So hopefully you kind of enjoyed this slight structure change for the most part. But we've got the video of the episode to talk about, and that is going to be Turnstile and Bad Bad Not Good with New Heart Design. So this is essentially two artists, Turnstiles, um, New Rock, Rock, somewhat punk um, band, essentially kind of coming together with Bad Bad Not Good, um, newer jazz fusion band, who essentially do some reimagining covers of three of Turnstiles' uh, songs from their last album. And it works out really good. I would say if you're not a rock fan, be more of a jazz fan, give us a listen. If you're a fan of rock, but you want to hear more jazz versions of rock songs or a rock lead singer or progression, all that kind of stuff, I don't know the technicalities of music, I would highly recommend listening to it. It's 10 minutes long. It's a fantastic EP that is just awesome. And the video they've shot, it is the classic case of the footage we shot while we were on tour. But I think there is an there's an awesomeness to how they shot it and how it's, uh, I don't know how you explain it, very accepting and very positive in a good way, which I think a lot of artists don't really promote that too much anymore, which is a big shame. But yeah, no, that's going to be the video of the episode. That was the podcast. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I want to thank everyone for listening to the podcast, especially if you listened all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you um, deciding to listen to this podcast because you have plenty of options on YouTube. Um, like the episode, subscribe for more because there's going to be a bit of a shape up, um, shake up in terms of things I'm going to be making, not just on this channel, hint, hint. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I guess I will end this podcast like I always do by saying I was the angry raccoon and I will see you on the next podcast.